Hello friends and welcome to another day of crocheting crime. My name is Hazy Baby and this is my channel where I crochet and talk about crime. Specifically Australian crime, although I do make myself make myself around the world. I do take myself around the world. Virtually. Um, and report some stories about other places as well. Today I am starting a new project because I realise that the Pikachu is awfully boring to continue to look at because he's humongous and it's just row after row of yellow and I got bored with it so I will continue to make him but I'll do him off screen and I have decided to start myself a new blanket. If it gets sold, it gets sold, that's great. If it doesn't, well it looks like I'll have another blanket in my house. That'll be all for me <laughs> for once. Um, anyway, I'm going with these lovely pastel -y uh, creams and pinks. That's Raymond up there. And yeah, I'll see you in Good morning, friends. Like I said, uh, yeah, I was running out of time in the video, hence the reason why I just cut off. But it's okay, I'm going to be starting a new project today. I'm going to be starting this lovely blanket of mine. So, my plan, I think, is to crochet um, while writing this pattern down and telling you guys the news. So you'll have to bear with me today because there's a little bit of a format change. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because this blanket is, I've just decided just now, is going to uh, consist of nine squares. So there'll be nine identical squares with different sort of color patterning, but the same sort of color palette. So um, yeah, so if you would like to order one of these lovely blankets that I make, please go over and just leave a comment. Um, and I will endeavor to get back to you and we can talk about, you know, what you would like, if you would like one, what you would like me to make. And when I say I can make anything, I literally can make anything. It'll just take me time, effort and energy. Okie dokie. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's get this day started. All right. So I think I have an update. I don't think I have an update. I have an update for you guys about a few things. So firstly, as soon as I found my mouse. Firstly, let's have a look. Alrighty. So yesterday, in yesterday's video, if you haven't been um, following me, then please go over and find yesterday's video. They're all labelled with the with the day. Uh, so yesterday's video was, sorry, one, two, three, four, uh, the 22nd of the 5th. Today is the 23rd of the 5th. And in yesterday's video, I was talking about a young boy who had been, um, chased after by three other teens with machetes, uh, sorry, two teens with machetes and a knife and uh, I cried in that video because it was absolutely so tragic. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and now I have some more news about the killers of this child. Well, they're searching for them. So I've got a little quick update on that one. So I'll just give you guys that. So hold on. One, two, one, two. So I'm counting these little Vs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm going to go 11 and 12. Slip stitch into the top. Tighten that bitch. Skirt! Skirt! Okay, so if you'll see what I just did, I did the first row and used a magic circle for those of you who crochet along with me when I crochet. And I finished off that first row and I'm going to grab this magic circle bit here. I'm going to tighten it as tight as it'll go. And then I don't want to blow out. So a blowout being that the actual, like later on when the blanket's made, it blows out because it's a magic circle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push this tail through here. And then I'm going to tighten it off that way and tie it off. And now, hopefully, I won't get a blowout. 
like I do other times. So. Alrighty, so police are appealing for the public to help track down um, the uh, missing teen, a missing teen after the death of a 16 year old person in Melbourne last week. So the alleged stabbing occurred at the at Station Place at Sunshine on the la, sorry last Thursday, where it's understood a group of high school students got into an altercation um, with Liam and a group of friends. Oh, sorry, this is a different boy. This is a different boy. This is not the machete boy. This is a different boy. Oh, so many incidents has been happening. So during the incident, the year 11 uh, college boy was allegedly stabbed in the neck. This is He was stabbed in the neck at a train station while the other students and commuters were around. So that sucks. Two... So this is not that same story, I apologise. Uh, despite paramedics' efforts, he was pronounced dead at the scene. The cause of the fight remains unknown and police have launched a full investigation. So two boys, a 17-year-old Caroline Springs and an 18-year-old from Burnside, have since been interviewed by officers, though both have been released without charge. Officers are now appealing for the public to help locate a third teenager, a 17-year-old hillside boy, um, Mahik Ahem, who is believed that can help them with their inquiries. Mahem is described as being between 185 centimetres tall. And 190 centimetres tall, with a slim build, black hair and short dreadlocks. Um, He's known to frequent Sunshine, Hillside, and Braybrook. So, yeah, so uh, images um, of the teen has been released. So you can actually go on the Nine website if you would like to see what that teenager looks like. I just thought I would show you guys once more before moving on to the next row. So yeah, I'm going to be doing nine of these. So just doing two on camera for now, and then we'll move on to the others a little bit a little bit later. Yeah, so CCTV footage was taken nearby the scene shows a black man in a hoodie uh, running with a large knife. Yeah, distraught. The brothers and stuff are so distraught, obviously, because their brother was killed in a, in such a horrible way. It's been known that he was a kind person and so young. So that they're asking for anyone who has any information to please contact the police immediately. So anyone who has CCTV footage, anyone who has um, knows where this child is, please contact the police because they would like to talk to this person. So yeah, there's a bit of a manhunt. Okie dokie. So this one is actually the update. Once I find it. (laughs) We're getting there, guys. I'm getting there. I'm so sorry. Today is just so cluster fudged. All right, let's, let's have a look. Okay, so senior constable... Okay, let me start again. Yesterday, I spoke to you guys about um, a 95-year-old woman who had been tasered by police. Yes, you heard that correctly. Tasered by the police here in Australia because she had a steak knife and she was threatening the police. She's receiving end-of-life care at the hospital and is a huge uproar, which 
you would assume it would be. <clears throat> but yeah, so that's fun. But the constable has now been stood down, which I think is great. And at the bare minimum, what should be done. So senior constable who allegedly tasered the 95-year-old care resident has been stood down from duties pending an investigation. So New South Wales Police uh, confirmed in a statement today that the officer, aged 33, has been suspended from the force without pay uh, until a formal inquiry is complete. Sorry, with pay. Should be without pay, just saying. Don't taser a 95-year-old lady. Anyway, whatever. Um, so, yeah, she's believed to be receiving end-of-life care, which was what I heard yesterday as well. Um, and they're saying that's due to a head injury, but not for the fact that she'd been tasered. She wouldn't have had a head injury. So she was using a walking frame while holding a serrated knife and moving at a slow pace and was tasered. So legit, guys. You know, anyone could have taken her down with a simply talked her down I think and even if they couldn't because she had dementia I'm sure that someone could have very nicely there would have been so many other ways to handle this situation but no taser a little old lady that makes way more sense geniuses okay what have I got here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and one more through that middle one right there i like it when you do that right there 12 Ta -da. so yeah that constable has been stood down which is great because like i said you know who was she a threat to she was 95 years old she had dementia she had a walking frame she was walking towards them super slowly it was like being attacked by the slowest you know villain ever and then they tasered her good job Good job, genius. Good job. Um. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, this next story is actually a story that's been on the go for a little while here in Australia. And it's the Hannah Clark story. And so the Hannah Clark story is about a lovely, wonderful lady who was murdered along with her children after a DVA claim had been put out. So... In February of 2020, the name Hannah Clark was etched into the nation's consciousness after her estranged husband killed her and her three young children, Aaliyah, six, Lillian, four, and Trey, three. It's one of the most horrific, and I agree, acts of domestic violence that Australia has ever seen. Like, there was people, and, you know, I don't know them personally, but there was people here who were just... Everyone was in an uproar, which is, you know, fair. It's it's fair, guys. Like, that's, that's pretty tragic. I'm going to go with this colour. Yeah, so let's get started with this story. So it was, like I said, it brought the issue to the forefront um, of the Australian consciousness. And we're talking about what happens behind closed doors in our streets and, you know, in our everyday homes, sparking conversation about a form of domestic violence that few people have heard of and it's called coercive control um coercive control is the kind of domestic violence in which the people they're pretty much gaslighted um yeah i was just trying to think of like a way to describe what it is just give me a second i'll find i'll find someone else's words that'll be helpful Okay, let me tell you a little bit about what coercive, con uh, coercive control is here in Australia and also what that 
Australia is doing about it. So Queensland is one step closer to criminalizing criminalizing commercial <laughs> Let me start again. Queensland is one step closer to criminalizing coercive control after passing new legislation to strengthen the state's domestic violence laws. While the amendments did not list coercive control as a standalone offence, Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk and Attorney General Simon Fentiman said that legislation lays the groundwork for happening this year. It's a significant step towards um, achieving a commitment of legislation against coercive control, justice for women and domestic violence and prevention portfolios. So let me just have a look. So, yeah, and that all sparked in 2020 when this family was murdered. But I just want to actually find out for you guys the actual definition. Okay, so coercive control is an act or a pattern of acts of assaults, threats, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. So it's that constant that that constant um, control, that constant need to be telling people, you know, where to go, what to do, who to see, that kind of stuff. That kind of stuff. So that is the actual definition. Was it three? Sorry. Four and five. I'm do a puff. One and two. Okay. Actually, no, I don't want that. I changed your mind. I know what I want. Alrighty, so let's move on now. Let's go back to our other story that we were talking about. Okie dokie. So, now three years on, there's been a new podcast presented by Nine News, if you would like to go and have a look at it, that goes beyond the headlines to tell the whole story of what happened, what's been learned, and what still needs to change. So, as a heartbreaking and confronting as this story is, it needs to be told, and I agree, it so does, because it is super duper important that these sort of stories get told. So the podcast itself is a rare opportunity to take a look at every element of the domestic violence in this situation. So, which is nice. Um, and like I said, even though the story itself is tragic, it'll be an interesting listen to for sure. So if you have the time, please go and head on over to the Nine News website and find it. It's really good. Um, I have been starting to listen to it, so it's great. Uh, it's about looking at what needs to change in order to protect women and men in abusive relationships to ensure that this kind of thing never happens again. And yeah, I think it's a good idea. And five... Yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. Mm -mm -mm -mm. It's pretty confronting and shocking and a little bit upsetting, but that's okay. But so is Hannah's whole story because it's a true story and we have to help people learn from this. So we need to know the red flags. We need to know um, what's out there and what to look out for ourselves. And hopefully it'll understand, um, it'll help us understand with more knowledge how coercive control can be like minimized and criminalized in the future. So across each episode, listeners are shared the details of the weeks and months and even years leading up to the crime that the public has yet to be told. Among many of the voices is the QAS medical director, Dr. Stevens Rushford, who was at the scene the day and he had spoken about it. So basically, if you don't know this story, if you're not from Australia and you haven't heard about this um, Hannah Clark, I will give you a brief, very brief um, summary of what happened. So basically, her husband had been um, abusing her and she'd finally gotten the courage to leave him. Give me a second. Okay, 
So it's a little bit more than that. So Hannah Clark met New Zealand-born Rowan Baxter. So Rowan Baxter, this is why it's important and why it came to the forefront. It's not just that he was, uh, what he had done was so abhorrent. It's also that he was quite famous. Um, She met him when she was 19 years old. And he's a former rugby league player who trialed with the New Zealand Warriors. Um... So he was, like, semi-famous, if that makes sense. Um, People did know who he was. And in 2012, they had three children, Aaliyah, Liliana, and Trey. Reports emerged after the murders that Clark had allegedly emotionally, physically, sexually, and financially abusive towards Baxter, which led to her leaving him. They were all the reasons why she decided to leave. Um, so Baxter was subjected to a DVA claim after he allegedly kidnapped Liliana, um, on Boxing Day of 2019, and he rejected his lawyer's advice for medication and refused to, um, sign a consent order, um, offered by Clark to allow him 165 days of custody a year. So she was, she was willing to give him a fair amount of custody of their children. Obviously, he'd never been abusive towards the children, only towards her, um, and he'd apparently been such a loving father towards the children. I mean, what he did next tells me he wasn't. Um, he refused to sign the consent order because he wanted all or nothing, basically. And on the 19th of February, 2020, Clark was driving their children Uh, to drop them off at school when Baxter doused the interior of the car with petrol and set it alight. Clark was pulled burning out of the car by bystanders and she told them that Baxter had poured petrol on her. While the car was burning with her three children inside, Baxter stopped bystanders by pulling... stopped bystanders from pulling them out... Of the car. So not only did he set his own children alight alive, he also then stopped anyone from helping them. After which he then stabbed himself to death. Clark was rushed to the Royal Brisbane Hospital with burns on 97% of her body, but she died she died later that evening. Which I'm kind of glad. I mean, as a mum. I'm telling you, if I woke up and all of my children were dead and the way they horrifically died, I don't think I would want to keep living either. So, I mean, what did she have left to live for, to be honest? So that is that very tragic story and you can see why it shocked Australia and you can see why we all went, what the, this needs to stop. Um, Because that is just one of one case of domestic violence and it's an extreme case yes for sure um and i'm really sad that it's taken this to bring it to light but i am glad that it has been brought to light and that um one two three four uh yeah that we are doing something about it i mean it's three years later i feel like it should have done more. But anyway, so in March, Legacy established a foundation called Small Steps for Hannah in honour of the slain children. And the charity states that it will put a halt to incidences and the severity of domestic violence in Australia. So on the 23rd of February, over a 1,000 people gathered to celebrate and mourn the family at a public vigil. Um, and on the 8th of September, 2020, Hannah's place was opened up at Cooperoo Council. So they have been trying to, like I said, raise awareness. And now the podcast is going to go into more detail about, uh, like I said, about the other parts of it. So if you guys would like for um, to listen to that, just head on over to the Nine News website and you can listen to it. It's, it's uploaded weekly and I am finding it quite interesting um yeah or I can give you guys a recap either way I'm happy to do either but I don't know how they would feel about me doing a podcast recapping their own podcast probably not cool 
Um, probably also illegal. I'll have to double check all that. <laughs> but anyway, let me know what you think about this case. Okay, I'm going to move on now and move on to a different story for today. As soon as I write down this pattern. And as you can see, I weave my ends in as I go. Um, I find it much easier. And it means that towards the end, all I've got to do is snip, snip these little toggly bits because they're all weaved in already. So there's no need. There's no need. Ta-da! Da -da 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 -da. Okay. Let's go to our next story for today. That was a bit of a long one, actually. Alrighty, so this is another one of police behaving badly. Hmm, That's my own little shorthand for myself later, which I probably won't make any sense of later when I try to make sense of it. Okay, so a New South Wales police officer who knocked an Indigenous teenager unconscious after performing a leg sweep, has been found guilty of assault. Two weeks out from his 17th birthday, the boy was sent to the ground head first after Constable Ryan Barlow um, took out his legs during an attempted arrest. The boy has been heard on recording saying, you didn't have to hurt me several times throughout the ordeal, including that he was laying on the ground with a 30-year-old 30, 30 kneeling on top of him. And people, that's how people die. People die from that. Um, he was arrested for saying, I'll crack you in the fucking jaw, bro, to Barlow, after four officers approached him and a group of friends in the inner Sydney park on June 20, in June of 2022, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's words, dude. He's... Yes, I know you're a police officer, but there was really no need. So Barlow said he felt threatened by the boy and performed a leg sweep. Bullshit. You just wanted to put him on his ass. Because the teen had kicked out at his groin area during the arrest. <laughs> I call bullshit. I simply didn't see what Barlow says occurred, Magistrate Remy said, um, because they had the, the cam footage, so the judge couldn't see it, so it didn't happen. The complaint is that the 16, uh, now 17-year-old person standing with three to four metres away from officer making no movements towards him. So body-worn footage from police officers as well as mobile phone footage taken from the boy's friends for safety showed no kicking action from the boy as well as no reference to kicking officers before um, he was leg-swiped. When the boy continually asked why he'd been arrested, Barlow said, for threatening an officer. And he said, I didn't threaten you. Um, I didn't think you'd care. I didn't physically hurt you. Did I hurt you? The boy said during the arrest. It's a threat, mate. You said you'd crack me across my face, mate. We all heard it. A police statement from the officer after the arrest did not refer to any kicking action. So that must have been just something he made up on the spot afterwards. Genius. Um, yeah, so he sounds like a cherry, guys. He sounds like a real, mm, like a prize, doesn't he? Doesn't he sound like a prize police officer? That's all these people who think that they have extra authority because they happen to wear a badge. It doesn't make you shit. I make you shit. And you know what? You need tougher skin, dude, because if you're going to get all upsetty spaghetti because some kid said he was going to crack your head open, then you're a moron, an absolute idiot. Um, apparently he was arrested for attempting to steal a can of Coke and allegedly <laughs> a toy gun in response to officers drawing their weapons. Oh, okay, so they made, there was an incident, I was going to say, what have I missed? Okay, so... The reason why this police officer was a bit trigger happy, according to the judge, is that the night before, 
he had an earlier incident involving the same boy where the same boy was attempted attempted to steal a can of coke and allegedly he was brandishing a toy gun in response to police officers and made them draw their weapons which absolutely i think is bullshit so i just feel like this is just convenient but whatever um the toy gun lit up i had some difficulty accepting that the incident had played out any significant role in bilo's mind according to the judge so the judge was like i'm not having any of it i think you're full of shit and i'm like yeah go judge go go judge go mm, mm, mm. i think three three should be good yeah that judge was like mm, i'm calling bullshit <laughs> i don't know why the judge was suddenly american but he was I'm calling bullshit. And Southern too, apparently. Anyway, officers were investigated on an unrelated matter, according to the Housing Commission nearby, when they saw the group of teenagers gathered in the park, which is actually what really happened. They went to the teenagers in the park and accosted them. The teenagers apparently had said something like, leave me alone or I'll kick you in the head. And that police officer got all upset, his spaghetti, um, and wanted to teach this kid a lesson and leg swiped him. Uh, the police officer has not been sentenced to the assault yet, but hopefully it will in the coming days. <laughs> what an idiot. What a silly Billy. What a silly Billy. So, he's a genius. Alrighty, so our next story is an Australian pair have been nabbed in Siberia for a drug sting. <laughs> Say they were set up, of course, because, you know, you wouldn't admit that you were, you were like, oh no, I was set up. I didn't do it. They made me do it. <laughs> oh, I'm funny. I know. Oh, so one, two, three. Um, if you'd like to buy this blanket, guys, just inbox me. Um, I pretty much will be making it over the next three weeks. Uh, it will be about queen size, if not a little bit bigger. Just depends on how big I make these individual squares. Um, it will consist of, like I said, nine squares and it will be in this really pastel sort of um, feminine but not too feminine design. So if you would like that, then yeah, just inbox me and I'll let you know. Um, yeah, but you have a couple weeks to decide if you would like to buy it or if you would like to gift it to somebody for, a, you know, a present or something. I don't know, but just let me know in the comments or inbox me either way i'm happy okie dokie let's tie that off and then i will tell you about this siberian drug bust apparently siberian drug bust how pretty is that guys it looks like a little flower doesn't it look like a little flower pity so pity So pretty. Okie dokie, artichoke. So let us move on, shall we? So after making preparations, including buying a second-hand van and hiring an eight-ton truck and a forklift, an accused drug trafficker received disappointing news that the shipping container he expected wouldn't arrive. I didn't even need this one, David Campbell allegedly told Customs Broker in April of 2017 after one of the two containers he was expecting didn't show up. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Campbell, 53, is facing trial alongside of Tristan Waters, 39, accused of conspiring, conspiring, conspiring to import and possess border controlled drugs. So Walter has, Waters, sorry, has pled guilty to the second charge but denies the involvement in the import conspiracy. The pair are dramatically, were dramatically arrested in a Siberian hotel of January 2018 following a globe-trotting undercover police operation. Say that three times over. 
Okay, so their lawyer had described both men as expendable pawns in acting under duress and used by organized criminals and the police pursuing them. I mean, it's pretty genius of the criminals if you think about it. Pretty genius. Pretty genius. Yeah, so the Australian Federal Police set up an international lie. So Campbell's barrister, Ronald Dredd, told the New South Wales court on Monday. But they're allowed to do that. So Crown Prosecutor Sean Flood told the jury that the shipment was sent from China to Campbell's company in the steel industry, but he was told it got lost in transit while the containers were being delivered. Um, when Campbell learned the container had apparently been found by a man in New Zealand, but therefore he learned that the man was an undercover cop. So, ha ha, sucked in. Would you like me to fly over there? Uh, Campbell offered nothing his client would love to get his steel back. Mm hmm. Anyone else call bullshit? Meeting across the Tasman three days later, the undercover cop told Campbell that he wanted a finder's fee for the quote-unquote stuff. When they were talking, they just called it steel, mate. Campbell allegedly responded before being able to show some photos of the container's shipment. The Crown case is that there clearly aren't any steel, Flood said. So... He's basically saying that he never admitted to there being anything else but steel in it. He also he always called it steel, um, and so that's the prosecution that they're going with is that he was under the impression that it was steel and he had no idea what was in the shipping container. So that'll be interesting how it plays out, and we shall see um, how that plays out as it goes along. But he accepted his responsibilities for the possession charges apparently but refuses to accept responsibility for the importation of the cocaine all righty so when arrested in siberia waters said that he was just playing a part an expandable stand-in for the principal syndicate leaders to establish whether the undercover cops they were meeting were police or criminals looking to rip off the syndicate or return its cocaine, Dalton said. So he reckons that he only went across there because... <laughs> so first of all, he said he didn't realise that it was cocaine and he thought it was just steel, that he was under the impression. Then when he admitted to possessing the drugs, he changed his story and said that it was um, he was working with the other people to make sure that they weren't police and that he was an expandable member of the team and therefore no one important Which has me got red flags just like anyway the trial continues and hopefully i shall have some more information on that as we go but basically i call bullshit mother bullshit Alrighty, let us move along to our next story So a woman has been threatened with a machete during a carjacking in Melbourne's West. People are crazy with your machetes. So a woman has allegedly been threatened with a machete during a carjacking in Melbourne's West overnight, leading to a man being arrested and a police chase. <laughs> the incident occurred in the same suburb where the 16-year-old boy was allegedly killed with a machete um, after being chased on Thursday. So that's the boy I was talking about, the one that had been chased and then killed with a machete. A woman was unloading her car at about 1am today when she was allegedly approached and threatened by a man with a machete. What the flip was she doing outside at 1am? I'm not victim blaming. I'm just saying I want to know why she was outside at 1am. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody need to be outside at 1am. But, you know, it's a free country. She should be able to go outside and feel safe. It's just, I just, yeah, I would never. <laughs> I'd be like, whatever it is, it can wait till tomorrow. I ain't going outside at 1 a.m. unless I'm taking my big-ass dog with me. Oh, guys, this is so beautiful. So beautiful. You know you want to buy it. Alrighty. So that's one half double crochet in each. 
stitch. Alrighty. So, he allegedly then stole her car because, like, you know, he had he was brandishing machete, guys. I would have said take whatever you like. Um, and he was arrested at Beach Court less than an hour after the car the carjacking. So they used a helicopter unit to track down the car, which was travelled about forty two kilometers um, to to Gisborne, where the driver allegedly dumped it and then ran, jumping over a residence fence. And you can actually see the camera footage of him like jumping the fence. Uh, police found the machete in the car. The twenty year old Ukraine man was, sorry, Enoch man, had been charged with aggravated carjacking with an offensive weapon, threat to inflict serious injury, aggravated assault, and driving a dangerous and speeding and possessing a controlled weapon. He's expected to appear at the Sunshine's Magistrate Court later on today in an unrelated alleged carjacking occurred the day after the footage emerged of two boys being armed with machetes chasing teenagers in Melbourne streets moments before his death on Thursday. So like I said, there's a lot there's been a lot of like um stabbing happening and macheteing happening. So it's really and I agree, residents are now calling for the police to sort out why there is so many weapons being handled in the area. But apparently it's got they found fifty two weapons within two hours when they went on a weapon search last week. And so now I feel like they really need to up the ante and talk about what the heck is happening and why so many weapons are being carried by, by people, uh, specifically why they're being carried by children. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause this video for a second. I need to go find my little pins so that I can pin this out into a square so I'm going to be turning this into a square but I need to be making sure that my maths is correct because I tend to just wing it and for this I really needed it to be correct so um, I'll be back in a second okay so I couldn't find them so instead I will just wing it but I'm going to wing it in a different way than what I normally would so first of all I need the next color it's going to be this lovely pink Okay, let's do this instead, since it's sets of two, should be able to easily do what I need to do. Okie dokie, so a family of a woman who killed violent and abusive husband with a poison bicky pled with the judge to show mercy. So she is the one who killed him. She killed him with a poisonous biscuit. Yep, you heard that correctly. Good old poison bicky story. Okay, so missing three, one, two, three posts. I'm gonna start there. Two, six, so one, two, three, four. Um, six. That'll do it. That'll do it. Okay. So, loved ones of a woman who killed her violent and controlling husband with a poison biscuit have pled with the judge to show her mercy. So, Rebecca Payne says that she was abused for years by her husband, Noel, who... <clears throat> made her tattoo his name on her body 18 times and beat her in a graveyard. But prosecutors say she could have just left. I mean, yeah, okay, guys, clearly never been in an abusive relationship before. And how'd that work out for the last people that have left? I hate how people, they just you just don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. Anyway, so Payne faces life behind bars after a jury found her guilty of murdering her husband, Noel Payne, who was given a fatal dose of temazepam, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a painkiller drug, but also it's a antipsychotic uh, drug, laced in the icing of a biscuit she gave him with a cup of Milo. Good honour. 
Uh, I mean, what? No, that's terrible. She'd never kill anybody. She told jurors that she hadn't meant to kill him. She only wanted to put him to sleep permanently. Six. Afterwards, she wrapped his body in a blanket and stored it in a chest freezer in the backyard of their home in a remote western um, Victorian community in Willop. So, she was hoping he wouldn't be found. That's for sure. That's for sure. So, there is still so much support for her from the community... <clears throat> she's the victim and not the perpetrator, local John said. Uh, I think she is the perpetrator, but I also think she is the victim. I think you can be both at some point. I think she got over his bullshit and said, this is it, I've had enough. But that doesn't mean that she shouldn't be punished. She shouldn't take someone else's life, but she should definitely. I mean, it's hard. You can say all you want to say, but I don't know what I would do in that situation. If I had an abusive partner, I don't know what I would do. Like... I've seen all these shows, you've heard all these stories, even when people do get away. I mean, just go and ha go back to the 90s and have a look at any early, late 90s, early noughties movies with, like, Julia Roberts and shit, like, you know, about these abusive men who track them down and they end up having to kill them because it's the only way they can get away from them. I mean, I know that this is fiction, but, you know, fiction is reflective of life. Otherwise, no one would watch it. Um, so she was regularly in hospital. There's even like stacks and stacks of hospital records. So I just want to say that if any sort of, um, battered wife syndrome could come into play here, it should have in this case. So she lived 14 years in hell with him prior to what happened. But I just hope that they go easy on her. He said it was the community that Noel created a um, prevented and disturbing moral universe in which he treated his wife more like an object for his own pleasure than like a human being. Everybody in the town knew so. Good job, everybody in the town who did fucking jack shit to help her. Nice. Alrighty, his actions towards pain were reprehensible and obscene, said the judge. But we can't take the law into our own hands, and I kind of agree. She probably just wanted a break from him. <laughs> Who knows? One, two, three, four, five, six. So the town and her family is pleading for them to not give her too much sort of time, if you will. So Payne dabbed away tears with a tissue and her lawyer outlined some of the horrifying abuse she suffered at the hands of her husband while trying to raise two boys. You've heard evidence of him... This is what the prosecutor said. You've heard evidence of him repeatedly spitting on Rebecca, watching her in the shower, heard evidence of her being taken to a graveyard near her family home and bashed. Um, Rebecca had 18 tattoos of the man's name on all parts of her body. At one point during the relationship, Payne left her husband, so she did leave, um, and she returned in the meantime... Uh, Noelle Payne had moved another younger woman into their home and began a sexual relationship with this newer younger woman. In a statement, that woman told the court that Payne had made her get his name tattooed on her body five times. He sounds like such a keeper, guys. Oh, my God. In a statement... She told how he was violent towards her as well. The family violence she suffered could not be separated from her offending, telling Justice Ridica that the case of pain should be should be that we show mercy on her. But prosecutor David Glenn said that um, the trial pain ended up dead if events had left to run their course is pure speculation. I don't agree. I think he would have killed her. Guys, I really do believe that she had every had every um i do believe her fear was warranted if that makes any sense like i do believe that her fear of him got eventually killing her was is pretty warranted so what have we got here one two three four five six seven eight perfect I think 
I'll go with this color next okay so let's move on he said Payne had a car a phone and nine thousand dollars cash and knew she could leave her husband because she had left him before and gone back this was not a woman who was helpless and unable to act, he said. I call bullshit. She acted and what she did require a significant level of planning, thought, and above all, I would suggest determination. I say that she decided that she wasn't going to allow this abuser any more freaking, what's it called, um, power, basically, and she was going to go back and kill this motherfucker, and I agree with her. Mm-hmm. I hope you don't get any time in prison whatsoever. <laughs> But that's just my thoughts. Uh, the murder was planned at least days and weeks in advance, involving cooking the biscuits, grinding the tablets, putting them in icing, and then moving the body. Must have been ghastly to do what she'd done to him, someone who isn't a psychopath. Not that I'm suggesting that she is one. He's such a fuckwit. God, I hate prosecutors sometimes. But he later conceded that the evidence established that Payne was subjected to violence and coercive control. She will be given a sentence at a later date, and hopefully I'll have an update for you guys. But jeebus, Louibas, prosecutors are harsh, man. Prosecutors are harsh. Alrighty. Okie dokie, artichoke. So I think that's enough for me today. Basically, the next row I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into a square. But you can see where it is a square now. So it's a square there. From these four and there's a square there from those four so i was thinking i could either go <laughs> around it and make it look all bam or i could start in here in meh in meh but i haven't decided yet but i will see how it goes do you guys want one more story before i go should i do one more story okay then because you all collectively asked me just now in my head for the next story but we'll do another one so a man's been charged after an alleged hit and run that left a woman with the life-threatening injuries in noble park so that doesn't sound very noble does it but i'm i'm so clever guys i'm so clever Alrighty, i'm gonna do i'm gonna do hmm, what does this button do i know what i'm gonna do one two three four Five, six. I'm back into here. Oh yeah, that's gonna look nice. So I think I'm gonna do. One, two, three, and four, and then two, one, two. Oh yeah, that's gonna be beautiful. Okay, so a 64 year old man has been charged with nearly two days, nearly, sorry has been charged nearly two days after a woman was struck by a van in alleged hit and run in Melbourne's southeast. So this was the other day I was telling you guys about a homeless woman who was struck by a van in a hit and run, dragged 50 to 70 metres down the road, and then the van just like skedaddled off. So Sarah Phillips, who was 34, was rushed to hospital after being allegedly hit crossing the Heatherton Road near Avon Street in Noble Park with her partner on at 7pm on Saturday night. So, the alleged driver of the vehicle failed to stop at the scene, which was true, he did fail to stop at the scene, and police were calling for CCTV footage and all of that jazz, and um, obviously they have identified the car and then therefore identified the driver. So, Paul Kilquop part Philip's partner had made an emotional plea earlier that morning for the driver to come forward uh, saying that she was a beautiful person that she was lovely she was big-hearted anyway Philip's um sustained injuries but remains at the Alfred Hospital in intensive care like trying to you know battle for her life 
Neighbours and a number of witnesses stopped to help Philip as she was struck when they first um, aid for emergency services arrived. So they actually, like, provided first aid for this woman, which was, like, so nice that they all just rushed out and gave her a hand. Um, Dandelong Northman then presented himself to the police that afternoon, which is really nice that he came forward and that police didn't go and have to find him. I mean, it's pretty shitty of him to, like, run her over to start with, but I am glad that he woke up to himself and decided to um, hand himself in. So he'll be bailed, um, he was bailed, sorry, and he will appear at the Melbourne's Magistrate Court on Wednesday, so that's tomorrow, and I'm glad that he came forward because it means he was able to get bail. I think if they'd probably found him themselves, I don't think he would have been as lucky to get bail. So I don't know if I want to do two in here, guys, or if I want to do four. I think two should be enough, but I think I need to do an extra... Maybe one, two, in the corner. Let me see what that looks like. And then if that's the case, I need to go back and undo it. Yeah, see, that looks much nicer. Alrighty, I'm going to have to go and undo it now. Frog it all the way back. But at least I know what I'm doing. Okie dokie, guys. So I think that's going to be enough for today. Like I said, I think this video is probably long enough. You guys are probably overhearing my voice. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your time and effort and energy today, guys. And I shall see you guys tomorrow. And hopefully I will be on the same round, but just doing a different square. Um, I endeavor to catch up on my crochet along today. So if you follow me on TikTok, then you shall see those videos a little uploaded a little bit later on today. Um, if you would like this blanket or if you would like me to commission, uh, commission me to make me a piece for you, then please inbox me and let me know. If you'd like to win a blanket, so I'm currently my crochet along Raymond, is the blanket that I am giving away to one of my first 1,000 subscribers. All you have to do is subscribe and comment on one of my videos, then you can go into the draw. So how cool is that? There we go. Alrighty, I'm going to stop this video now, and I thank you guys so very much, and I shall see you tomorrow. Bye!